I hope you're all doing fine. Um, so community questions I've asked on the Facebook private group. If you haven't seen or you're not a part of that, you can join it. There should be a link in the description. Uh, and then I also asked in the community area on YouTube. So going to go over a bunch of those questions now. Don't know if I'll get to all of them. Before we get started with today's video, I just wanted to let you know about my website, jrtv.com, where we have hundreds of different templates available for DaVinci Resolve 17, 16, and 15. All of them are backwards compatible with the newest version of DaVinci Resolve. If you haven't taken a look, the selection of templates is pretty diverse with everything that you would typically think when you think templates, everything from titles, transitions, infographs, logo stings, slideshows, video displays, video effects, compositing elements, as well as a bunch of color pre Preset tools specifically for DaVinci Resolve's color page. If you're interested in taking a look for yourself, there's a link in the description. So the first question is asking about having a shot that already has a transform applied on the edit page and then using dynamic zoom. And I'm guessing he's talking about the overlay not really representing where it's actually zooming in. And let me quickly show you here. So if you don't know what dynamic zoom in, it is it just an easy way to take a still shot like this and add some motion to it. So we can simply just click one button and now we have a zoom out or we can go swap and we have a zoom in. There are also controls with this. If you come down here and you go into dynamic zoom, we can see a start point and an end point, right? Or if you flip them, you can see the other way around, a start point and an end point. Um, and I'm guessing what he is asking is if I was to zoom in and do a shift like that, now, when I look at my dynamic zoom, it still goes all the way out, even though it already has the transform settings, these up here. I completely agree when I when we come into this view, it should be representative. But how I kind of wrap my head around it is we have the outside at 100% and then we have the inside at 1.5, um, similar to like the zoom if we were to move that around. And all we're doing is we're telling him, okay, it's going to start full frame and then it's going to go to wherever this frame is. So even though that the box is up here where it's currently zoomed in, we could then have it shift down, right? So um, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around, but we will have that same movement as you can see, it's going over. The on-screen, this on-screen representation doesn't really help. And I know that you would think if you'd make this into a compound clip or if you take it into Fusion and have it process, it still pulls the original. It's kind of weird. I don't like it. I understand what you mean, um, but that's what it is currently. Maybe in the future they will, um, you know, fix that, but that's what it is. Uh, the second part to his question was asking about different frame rates work on a timeline. So if you have a 30 frames per second uh, shot and you put it on a 24 frames per second, or if you, let's say you have a 60 per fr frames per second timeline and you put a frame and you put a uh, piece of footage that is 30 frames per second, how does that work? And I quickly will draw something to kind of represent how that is actually working. Before I dive into this, I just wanted to let you know that this is a super basic explanation of how interpolation works. All right, so this is pretty much how it works in a nutshell. Let's say that this top bar is whatever our frame rate, our timeline is, and then we have two different frame rate footage, pieces of footage. We have one that's, let's say our timeline is 30 frames. This piece of footage is uh, 24 frames per second, and then this piece of footage is 60 frames per second. And let's say that this is the duration of a second. Yes, it's not exactly one-to-one, -one, but I think this will represent uh, very well. Um, so in the top here, this is our actual timeline. What will happen is as this moves, we, at the beginning of this frame, let's say we were pulling from the uh, 24 frames per second shot, it's going to pull this image. And then as we get to here, now we're at a portion where it's like, okay, th the timeline needs to update to the next frame. What is it going to do? As you can see for the uh, 24 frames per second one, it, it calculates out the average, which one would be on longer, this one or this one. In this case, it would pull the same frame, but down below for the 60 frames per second, it's actually going to skip a frame and pull this frame. Right. So then when it's time to update again, it'll come over here and it'll pull this frame. And for this one, it'll pull this next frame and it'll go on and on and on that same way because there's an empty space. It'll pull the previous frame. And as this moves, it's pulling in whatever the closest frame is. 
that's going to, on average, be up for the longest period of time, closest to whatever the updating is on the timeline. Now, you would never really see this because if the timeline is 30 frames per second, it's going to look perfectly fine. You're just going to see a duplicate frame for the slower, and then you're going to have frames that skip for the faster frame rates. Again, the timeline is 30 frames per second, so you won't really notice it. This is what is referred to as the interpolation. There are a couple of different methods in which programs uh, deal with this differently, and you can actually change how this is uh, the average closest or nearest to, they call it. Um, and so it always works a little bit different, but this is like kind of the basis of it. Um, as we're going on, it's just looking at the the neck, the um, whatever that shot is, and it's trying to interpolate what would really be on screen if we had to print this to a different um, to a different timeline, right? What what would be showing? So as we see up here, we're on frame one, two, three, four, five, the fifth frame but on the 24 frames per second, we're only showing the third frame in that particular thing, right? But time-wise, you know, um, one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, actual real life time-wise, it's still gonna be playing the same. It's just, we're going to be seeing some frames twice. And again, this isn't something that we're really going to notice, or it's going to be skipping frames, um, as you can see down here, where we're skipping frames because in between here and here, there is a frame which gets skipped. So, so the next question is asking about Fairlight. And now I don't really cover a lot in Fairlight just because I know the basics of dealing with audio and getting hiss and hums and stuff like that out and kind of equalizing stuff. But I'm not really into being able to find uh, the space between you know one frequency range and being able to pull that down so you get another uh, sound bite to come through that. I, I'm, I'm not the one to uh, to really dive into that sort of thing. But I was asked what are the features on the Fairlight page that I really like. And I feel like the one that I really like out of all of it is really going to be the ADR stuff. Typically what ADR is, is if you have to redo lines or something like that, if you know maybe the sounds on set were really loud and you know you couldn't really hear it, so then someone's going to do a kind of voiceover in a sound booth. I really like this tool. It it makes things so easy because if I have to ever do a voiceover in DaVinci Resolve, I can easily do it using this tool and I don't need to get another voice recording program and I can just simply record right into here, do multiple takes if I need to until I get the right one and I can watch my timeline as I'm doing it. So that is probably my number one. The second one is actually on the other pages as well and that's going to be the sound library. And the sound library is really cool because uh, once you have it populated, you can look up different things. So I can look up bell and then boom, I have all of the different bell sounds. I don't know if I'm actually recording my uh, desktop sounds. There we are. And so I can just go in and I can listen to all of the different bell sounds that I have. And you know, I have a couple here and I can rank them and then I can take little snippets and I can drag them and drop them right onto my uh, timeline. So that's another tool, but that is on the edit page as well. So um, but yeah, those are probably my two favorites. Uh, the next one is asking about importing 4K videos from a PlayStation 5. I have no idea. I will have links in the description of all the codecs that are available. You have to make sure that you understand what the difference between a codec and a container are. Typically extensions or endings of a file. Um, so you know, MP4 or MOV and stuff like that, those are gonna be containers and there's lots of different codecs that can go inside of those. The codec is the thing that you're going to want to pay attention most to. So the next question is asking about like more ray. There are ways you can make it less noticeable. Um, definitely the purple stuff, that's easy to pull out. Uh, I don't think that I have any one specific thing to recommend. Um, but there are you know, a ton of different tools. If your whole shot doesn't have any purples in it, you can simply come over to the color page. You're gonna go right into your curves, come down to uh, hue versus saturation, hue versus loom, something of that nature, probably sat, you, which you would wanna go in, and you can go right into your purples and pull those out. Um, you can also come into your qualifier, specifically you know, pick whatever the color is and get it to be right, you know, right on your purples, and then you can make that a little bit smaller. 
by changing the width so that you get just those and then you're only affecting those and you can pull down some of that saturation so it's not as noticeable. Additionally, if it's all on a single color, which Moray typically isn't, it's gonna be kind of jumping between something bright and something dim. But if it's the same color, you can also come into hue versus hue and you can take like those purples and shift them. So if it's like a brick wall, you can shift them more towards the reds. Um, or if it's the sky or whatever, you can shift them more towards the blues, or you can just completely shift it and make it go all the way over. You also might have um, some luck with the color warp tool because you can take it drastic shift. So you can take it from the purple and put it in the green or the yellow, completely opposite side of the of the color wheel, relatively simply, and you can make it very tight on your on your um, settings. The, the dancing around, you're really not going to be able to um, fix that. You can kind of um, make those areas a little softer so that you it's not so distracting. Uh, you also asked a question about the Z camera and I had no idea what a Z camera was so I had to look it up. And you're talking about a Z uh, log plugin. I'm personally not that versed in it. Um, there might be some type of conversion, transform conversion that might be very close. They might be using a gamma curve from another company. So you might be able to look at what is a very close um, to what they have. I don't know if they're trying to do, you know, something completely unique. Most camera companies get very similar to other camera companies um, to kind of pull users that, that are into that look, but you could use a color form trans or a color space transform and that would kind of eliminate i don't know what the z log plugin really does i don't know what the footage looks like coming out of that and i don't know if uh davinci resolve uh you know particularly has anything like that when you come over into the camera raw settings they do have it for a bunch of cameras but i don't know about that particular one and getting rid of that particular plugin just because i'm not that versed in it so um the couple of things hopefully that 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 helps you out there I recently had a clip from a customer and color grading the sun changes the strength of the light in the scene. So I don't know what you mean by changes the strength. Are we talking about the sun is coming in and it's really hot on one particular subject? Or are we saying that the camera was all set to auto? Um, because depending on the camera, I mean, there could be so many different things that happen if it is in an auto um, and depending which auto mode that they that they were using i'm kind of guessing that that's what it was if that's what it was you're going to end up having to use a lot of keyframes on the color page if you've never used keyframes they're right in the here and you can keyframe different nodes that you have in your uh, node tree for the colors so when you know when it gets dark you can bring it up when it gets bright you can bring it down you can also fade from uh, one node to the other but it does suck if someone did shoot in auto, um, you know, even if the sun's out and bright and, you know, all over the frame, um, that does kind of suck. Try to find grade somewhere that is in the middle so you get a good grade overall on your shot. And then you only have to bring it up a little bit when it gets dark and bring it down a little bit when it gets a little too bright and try not to, you know, clip as much as you can. But yeah, shooting on auto is definitely a no, no. <laughs> I'm sorry you have to deal with that. There isn't any easy workaround to be completely honest with you. So the next one is asking about how to properly time keyframes. Now I'm not entirely sure if you're asking about timing keyframes on the edit page, the cut page or the fusion page. Assume that you mean the fusion page. So the idea here is that we're going to time them and have them move the same distance over the same amount of time so that they don't overlap. So here, let's say we're going to frame five. I would keyframe the center right to get it to move and then by frame 60 let's say we would go to 1.5 right to get this off the screen so now if i view this we have it going on screen and then it goes off the screen now we would do the same thing here but for this one we're going to at frame 60 we want it to be on the screen because that's where it's at currently on the screen here but then at frame 5 we want to go negative 0.5 Right, so now it's off the screen. So now if I view both of these, one is going off the screen and the other one's coming on and they're not ever overlapping. So the main thing is that whatever the move is, you're gonna have the, the same amount, even though that one's gonna be negative and one's gonna be positive, they're both gonna be moving the same amount of space over the same time period. 
so then you don't have any type of overlapping. So the next question is about the 70D and I really can't help you out there. I've never owned the camera, I've never used the camera, so I don't even know um, what it's capable of. Um, so I do apologize for that. So the next question is asking about having two different types of pieces of footage and wanting to put a LUT to uh, get them to be identical. Um, and how do you do that? Uh, well, while I was editing this video, I realized that I butchered explaining this. Uh, but pretty much you have two different ways that you can bring footage into Fusion or be working with it within Fusion and uh, have one of them or have either one of them from different cameras and want them to match. Uh, let's say Rec 709 or whatever it may be. So the first one is going to be a color space transform. So we can just go to color space and there's a color space transform. This will take it from whatever the input is and then whatever you want it to be in output. So inputting whatever the camera information is and then outputting to whatever you wanna work in. So that's one way of doing it. The other way, uh, you did mention in your uh, question that you wanted to use a LUT. The other thing that you can do is file LUT and a file LUT it will bring in uh, footage and then you pick your LUT and then it'll do whatever the, the switch is in remapping the colors to whatever your LUT file is. Personally, I recommend doing the color space transform. Um, so yeah, th those are your two options for that. You just bring in whatever your piece of media is, have it pass through there and then continue on with uh, the rest of uh, building out your fusion comp. So the next question is retiming the video, but not having an effect the audio. Now this isn't very difficult, uh, but understanding a few couple, uh, a few things will make this significantly easier. So now we have our clips here. And one thing that you'll notice is when I click a clip, it clips, it uh, highlights the video and the audio. Now, Anytime that multiple things are highlighted, it's going to affect them, right? So we have to get it in a, in a, state that they're not both being clicked. Now there's a couple different ways we can do it. One, we could click on it, right click, go unlink clips. Now that they're unlinked, it will, when I click one, it won't click the other. But now we have this weird thing where I only move the one, right? So instead of doing that, keeping them linked, the other thing we can do is we have this link button here. If we click that, even though these two are linked and I click here, it's only going to click the one because we don't have the link button. But then we can just click it again and now when I click one, it clicks them both, and now we can move them. The other way that's even easier than that is if we hold down Alt, we can Alt and click just one of them, even when the link button's on and they're both linked. What that allows us to do is because only that one thing is currently active and selected, we can now edit it by itself without the audio. So if I come down here and now I go into uh, Retime Controls, now I can speed this up really, really fast, and I'll bring up the audio just so we can hear this. Now the video's playing really fast back, and it's a 4K video, so it's kind of struggling over my network, but we still have the whole audio, and it's unchanged. And because we didn't unlink it, and because we didn't turn off uh, link selection, we can still move them together. So that pretty much covers all the questions that were submitted to me. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Hopefully you guys learned something. Um, here in the near future, hopefully I can, uh, like I was saying at the beginning, show you guys what I've been working on. A lot of things going on with the website currently. So once all that's out, I will let you guys know. But uh, yeah, leave me in the comments some uh, stuff I should be making shorter videos until that point. But until the next one, stay safe. Hope you learned something. I'll see you guys later. My name's Jer. Thanks for watching. Peace.